I can tell you that uh, I remember, and it just seems like a blink ago, uh, that Brad stood here for his very first book uh, with a big, enthusiastic crowd just like the one today. It was filled with families and friends. Um, but while we, of course, honor the memories of Brad's wonderful mom and dad, who I always remember with such a smile every time they came, and, and, and Brad's dad would at the end go, how many did we sell? Tell me how many we sold. Um, I know that they would be just cavelling to see just where Brad is today. Um, he basically has taken the literary world by storm. Uh, he writes these remarkable thrillers. He's written inspirational books for kids, uh, not to mention the impact he's had on our own sort of uh, popular culture with his TV programs and his remarkable work with, uh, with comics and what he's done in that realm as well. He's got as many fans in that universe as he does in the universe of, of fiction. Um, but for all of us who really do know him, all of us in this room, uh, just as important to him as all of these other accolades is the remarkable work he does just here in the community. He and his wife, Corey, I know Corey's here somewhere, uh, you know, have brought City Year here to Miami. He and Corey have established scholarship, scholarship and literacy funding uh, to all different kinds of groups around town. Uh, but more importantly, it's the way he treats all of us, everyone in this room, as community. Um, you know, I was spending a little bit of time on his Facebook, uh, and he's got over 100,000 Facebook friends. And I think each one feels, as we do, that they know him personally. Uh, his menchiness is felt by all of us, his millions of readers as well. Um, and the way he does that is he brings us into his world. You know, you, I, mean, I don't see Brad but a few times a year and it's as if I've just you know, encountered a, a, a long-term a long friend that I've just seen just a week or so ago. He knows what's going on in my life. He keeps tab of everybody who's going on. And if you read one of his Facebook uh, posts recently, uh, at one of his events, I think he'll talk about it, it might have been in New York, uh, a kid that he went to grammar school with came and he immediately flashed back to a very uh, significant event that they both had together. So he's also got a really good memory, which as a 60 year old now, I really, really appreciate. Um, so we're really proud to have him tonight. But the reason we're, he's, we're here tonight is to launch this remarkable new book, The President's Shadow. And I thought by way of introduction, I would read a fantastic review that appeared in the New York Times just a couple days ago. Uh, a visit to the Rose Garden by the, by the First Lady opens The President's Shadow, the latest historical thriller from Brad Meltzer. And the twists and turns that follow will keep even the most jaded reader up all night. A severed arm is found buried in the Rose Garden, and the discovery immediately raises questions <clears throat> about security, the identity of the victim, and the culprit. Beecher White is called to a secret meeting where the president tells him that an item discovered with the arm links back to White's dead father. The mystery surrounding what happened has consumed him, and this discovery might finally bring some answers. White also must stop a bold assassin who has previously tried to kill the president and has now escaped custody. Meltzer blends history into the storyline, and a good portion of it is insider knowledge, giving authenticity to the conspiracy that is slowly unveiled. This is the third thriller to feature White, and it's a perfect cap to an amazing trilogy. <clears throat> Excuse me. So please welcome the amazing Brad Meltzer. Oh wait, Mitch, we need, I got, no, he's got it, don't worry. Only in Miami, everyone's got directions suddenly. Don't take the microphone, don't take this. Um, first of all, by the way, that's the best introduction ever because he used the word menchie um, and menchiness, which in Virginia, it's stone cold silence. <laughs> they have no idea what to do with that. Um, a, a huge round of applause for Mitchell Kaplan again, please. So, 
so it's, I'm not that bad. Save every, trust me, soon you'll be saying that. So let me, I just want to talk about Mitchell for a second because I've been on this book tour and I go to every big bookstore in the country and I, and I was at Politics and Prose and I'm at all these places and I always say the same thing. And even Politics and Prose said to me, the woman who owns it, which is, one, you know, the, that's the bookstore in Washington, D.C. that President Obama shops at, that Bill Clinton used to shop at. Um, and basically at Politics and Prose, the owner said, that bookstore that Mitchell has is the most beautiful bookstore in the country. And it's true. And she did say it. And, um, and I say that also, you know, when you buy your books, you vote. And every time you, listen, I know there's lots of options out there for people with books. You can push lots of buttons and stay at home. But come and be a part of the community. This is what, it's not a, just a bookstore. We know this is a community landmark. Mitchell himself is physically a community landmark. Um, we, we know that. And um, I love him. I love that he knows my parents. I love that he knows uh, they absolutely cared about the sales at the end of the day. Um, and I love that he is a part of our family. So love you, Mitchell. Thank you. Um, I'm going to save uh, so a couple quick thank yous because I can't do this, right? I just I was in Dallas, Texas at 3.30 this morning um, and, uh, and took a 5 o'clock flight back. And when I'm in Dallas, there's no family to thank because, let's be honest, how many Jews are in Dallas? Uh, that joke, by the way, also doesn't work in Virginia. Like, this dead, dying signs. In fact, I did a, I did a joke in, uh, where were we, in Washington, D.C., in, in Virginia, and I, it, it was a joke, and I said, you know, if you meet one president, it's enough, Dianu. And, right? Nobody laughed. Nobody. And I was like, this joke is going to kill in Coral Gables. I was like, I promise you. Um, so I want to th the people that I can thank here, this is the family stop. And I look around this room, and of course I see family friends, I see readers, um, and I see high school friends, and I see college friends, and I see, you know, people who are from all walks of my life. And of course I see uh, my immediate family as well. Um, yes, my son is here like me, as if I didn't know who my son was. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to start by thanking, uh, I got my, my sons here and I love them and I will warn you, um, Theo, stand up one sec. So this boy, see him, what he looks like? Um, stay there, stay there. So I will warn you that two days ago at the end of the signing in Virginia, all the people are coming up and I see and notice that Theo has money. He's got cash. And I'm like, where'd you get the cash? And I've realized he's been charging people for drawings to save up for the Lego Death Star. And I'm like, you can't charge readers for drawings. And then I stopped and I was like, that's brilliant, really. It's brilliant. So when I point him out to you to say, don't give him money. He's, he will do them for free, right? Free tonight, maybe? What do you think? No, Jen. The other day I said, will you do it for free tonight just for the good of helping people? And he said, I'll think about it. And he did bilk someone for a dollar. So tonight, it's profit only uh, at your own risk. And... Um, but don't, do not feel the need to feed that beast. Um, some other people that are here, uh, my mother-in-law and father-in-law, Dale and Bobby, who I love dearly and um, do more for us than I think most people realize. And they're here and, um, I, uh, where is Amy and Matt? Okay, I was gonna say, I, Amy and Matt are here. And uh, also, same thing, I wanna single out um, Dale and Matt. Because Dale and Matt, although they're family members, you'll see they're also listed separately in the acknowledgements. And it's because when I write the book early, um, they're the ones, there are four people that I really use to read the early versions of the book. And they're the ones I give it to. And they're great readers, and I love them for doing it. And each time, especially in Matt's case, and uh, his life gets busier and busier, and I know it's a pain in the rear end every time to kind of have to not just read it for enjoyment, but read it and take notes and have to do it all. And he does it every time, and I love you for that. And Mima, too, I love you for it. I appreciate it. Um, and here's the thing, are Adam and Hilda here yet? Do we know yet? No, not yet. Okay, so here's the thing, a surprise. So, so today is Hilda's birthday, is my, my sister-in-law and my brother-in-law, Adam, and they're late, which is the best part, because that means we can embarrass them. <laughs> so when they come, wait, okay, ready? We're gonna wait, oh, here they come, wait, here they go, come on in. Well, I was just gonna say, we're gonna say, Adam, you're late, so on three. One, two, three. Okay, now, the other thing we're gonna all say, and can we bring that out now for, for G? Do we have the one thing we're bringing out? Okay, here it comes. So today we say, Adam, you're late, but we also say on three, happy birthday, G. So we're gonna sing it together. One, two, three. Happy birthday to you. 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 Happy birthday to you
Happy birthday to you. <laughs> Happy birthday, dear G. Happy birthday to you. You got it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, pal. Um, you know how much Jewish guilt you get for being late and getting a cake? <laughs> Fantastic. Um, the, oh, and by the way, with the, again, key question, where's the cake going? We brought enough. You're going to be able to have a slice. Um, so have a slice of cake when it's all over. There's going to be cake in the cafe. So help yourself to G's cake. G will have uh, cake as well. But I, I said to her, I said, don't come enjoy your birthday. You see me enough. And she said, I want to come. So we, of course, got her some cake. Um, love you. So thank you. Um, so with that said, uh, my son's just like, he's good. He's good. Um, I love the good reviews from my family. So with that said, let's talk about the president's shadow. And I can usually, when I write a book, I can pinpoint the exact moment where I get the idea. And I could be, you know, for the inner circle, I was in the National Archives, and they took me around to a room that was called a skiff. It's basically a secret room where you read top secret documents. You don't read your top secret document at your desk. Someone could be looking over your shoulder or through a window. You read it in a skiff. It's a room that has inch thick walls made of steel. And it has, if there are windows, they vibrate so that no cameras could see through. They have their own air conditioning ducts that don't go with the other air conditioning ducts to make sure Tom Cruise doesn't come in on his trapeze, <laughs> you know, and come to the ground. And when I was in that room, and you can feel it's just different than everything else in the National Archives, I say, that's it. Here's the beginning of the book. I can pinpoint right there. That's where the beginning of the book came from. And I love that. This book is different. I can't pinpoint that moment except that I just woke up with it. I woke up with it and one morning just got up and I said, the first lady's in the Rose Garden and it's five o'clock in the morning. I've met first ladies. All they want is they just want normalcy. That's what they want back again. And she's in this Rose Garden and uh, she's a gardener, so she puts her hands into the dirt. She smells the mulch, and out of the dirt, she pulls a severed arm. And my wife is like, you have the creepiest dreams of all time. <laughs> um, and obviously, what I say when I wake up is not all put together like that, but I do have, I just woke, woke up with a severed arm, and it's buried, and here it is, and we're going to figure it out. And that's a plot. You get a plot, and you can figure out and make the best or worst of it. Um, it's fiction, and it comes just from my brain. However, what I love to do um, is I then take that plot, and I give it to the Secret Service in this case. And I went to the Secret Service, and I said, okay, pretend you really did need to investigate this buried arm. What would you really do? And to me, uh, I'm waiting for my answer. And he says, quickly, quick as could be, he says, the first thing I do is I would redecorate a room in the White House. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't even know. Why would you do that? And he said... I would, he said, think of it this way. He says, I take some paint off a wall. I, I take some paint off a wall or some wallpaper off a wall, put up some new paint, put up some new wallpaper. Now I can move the first family out of the White House. I can put them across the street in Blair House for a couple nights. Now I can do an investigation inside the White House. The press has no idea what I'm doing. Nobody knows what I'm doing. And no one's the wiser. And I'm like, that sounds like something you've done before. <laughs> right? And he said to me again, think of it this way. Bill Clinton. George W. Bush and Barack Obama have all redecorated rooms during their presidency. You wouldn't believe what's been done here in the name of home decoration. And I'm like, thank you for chapters two and three and four, right? I mean, that's where you get it. And uh, I would give him the book to write at that point. He was doing such a good job. But what, when you get to that part of the book, it's not my imagination on that page. It's a real Secret Service agent telling me exactly what would happen in real life. And that's what I love to do in these books is take that fiction that I can come up with and pair it with a reality that gives you a, a hyper reality where you know, and we all know when you read something, you go, that's real. That's got to be real. You don't make stuff like that up. And you'll see a scene in the book where Beecher goes into Secret Service headquarters. And he's in headquarters. Um, and I went into headquarters. Of course I went to headquarters. And they took me when I was there into a back room of the Secret Service. And it's like a museum. It's a small museum. It's really basically half the size of this big room. And they've got artifacts there, and there's badges, and there's guns from their most famous cases. There's a newspaper that's framed that says JFK dead. Really macabre things to keep. And they even have a picture and, and the actual um, car door from Ronald Reagan's car when he was went during the assassination attempt. 
And so we're talking about the Reagan assassination attempt. And the Secret Service agent says to me, you want to hear a cool story? <laughs> when the Secret Service says to you, do you want to hear a good story? You say, yes, I'd love to hear this story. And he says, here's the story. And he said, Ronald Reagan, when he was president, sometimes carried a gun with him. And I'm like, there's no way that's true. And he says, it's true. It was, it was a 38. He was sometimes put in a briefcase and taken on Air Force One. And my first thought is, um, I got to find out what, I, I contact President Bush Sr., who's helped me with some novels, helped me do research with some novels. I immediately contact him and I'm like, sir, if Reagan had a gun, you must have had something cool too. What'd you have? What'd you get in your pockets? And interestingly, I ask Bush questions and then usually, you know, I get some answers. This was the first time since I've met him and he's helped me with four books now that he asked me questions. And the question basically was, tell me more about that Reagan gun thing, right? <laughs> he wanted to know and like this guy ran the CIA and I was like, oh, he had no idea. And he said he'd never heard the story. Um, the nice part was since we broke the story, um, there's another Reagan biographer who verified it, another Secret Service agent who verified it, and I love that we get to put that out there. But the fun of it is to me that when you go into that scene and you see Beecher reacting to all the things that are in that museum, that's not Beecher, that's me. That's me in there, and everything he sees is everything I saw, and everything he was amazed by is what I was amazed by. And you'll get to see exactly that room. Of course, that didn't stop my obsession. I, of course, had to ask President Bush what he did carry, and it's interesting. Uh, Bush Sr., the dad, carried, uh, he, I, I found out, his driver's license. That was it. He would just carry a driver's license, which is odd because the Secret Service doesn't even let the president drive, right? <laughs> so I was like, were you going to bars and you were worried about being carded? Like, I mean, it's like a card. He's worried about being carded. I, I, I get it. He looks very young in those days. Um, Clinton used to carry a billfold. And he would have some things in it like, you know, money and credit cards. But he also always had a picture of Hillary, a picture of Chelsea, and a prayer that he always used to carry a prayer um, to be mindful of what, you know, what this office is. George W. Bush carried a badge of a 9-11 of a uh, police officer who was killed in 9-11, whose relative said, don't forget my relative, and gave Bush the badge. And for eight years, he carried that in his pocket. Um, and just like but just like Clinton's prayer, uh, again, you have to admire that they take these human moments and take it with them every single day. And President Obama uh, famously carries his Blackberry, also has, sometimes was seen with a little pad that he writes notes on, but he also keeps the things people give him. He doesn't just toss it back to his aides. So when you give him a military challenge coin or something like that, he just keeps them. And, he, and they're random. He doesn't, not always the same ones, but he keeps them. Um, whether it's to remind himself, God knows, no one knows. But he has him. He doesn't, oddly though, he doesn't carry a wallet. So he's been known to be overheard saying, where's my money? Which I love that you could be the leader of the free world <laughs> and be like, where's my money? Um, and it makes me think, oh, he's just like us, right? It's just like us, the same dumb crap we all carry, except that every president also carries one other thing, which is a little card that you crack in half and open and has the secret codes for the nuclear arsenal. Um, that's cool to have in your pocket, um, for sure. That's the one I want to see. So um, that's my obsession with that, with, with presidents in their pockets. And, um, and the other thing that I was obsessed with as I wrote this book is I, anyone who knows me knows I love the story of the Lincoln assassination in that moment in history. It's just an incredible moment that you can look at 50 million times and always find some new detail. And one of the things I found out, and I, you know, we all know John Wilkes Booth killed Abraham Lincoln. People know that. What we forget, all of us forget, is that there were eight other co-conspirators who were found guilty of the crime. And four of them were hanged, they died. The other four were sent to life in prison. They were supposed to go from Washington, D.C. to a prison up in upstate New York. I think it was supposed to be in Albany. And, but here's what really happened to them. And this is a true story. In the middle of the night, they're pulled out of their jail cells and they're thrown on a boat. And the boat starts heading not north to New York, but it starts heading south. And it goes past the Carolinas and it goes past Georgia, and then what state do you think it comes to, right? I was in Dallas, Texas this morning, and I said to them last night, I know you think Texas is crazy. I see your Texas crazy, and I raise you Florida crazy, <laughs> right? I could trace everything crazy. I mean, when we were doing lost history, every lost item came through Florida at some point. James Bond's car came through Florida. The moon rocks, where were they sold? Florida, I mean, everything I was like, it's like that moment in The Simpsons it's a famous scene in The Simpsons where they take over Camp Krusty 
and Homer's watching it on television, and they say that some kid has taken over Camp Krusty, and Homer says, don't let it be the boy. Don't let it be the boy. Don't let it be the boy. And then he sees Bart, and he says, doe. And every time when they would tell me that there was a lost historical artifact, I'm like, don't let it be Florida. Don't let it be Florida. And every time it's Florida. So of course, we have nothing to do with the crime and the killing of Abraham Lincoln. Where do they come? They come here. And they go past Miami, and the boat sails past Key West. And then they're like, there's nothing else here. There is nothing south of that. And of course, in this room, people know they go to a place that back then was secret. It was a secret island, then known as Devil's Island, also known as Fort Jefferson, and of course known as the Dry Tortugas. And this island is this amazing prison that was hidden, and I, of course, listen, I was like, you're telling me we have a secret prison where we kept Abraham Lincoln's killers off the coast of Florida? You better believe I went there. And so I went out there, and, went, and I won't ruin the book, but the last 100 pages of The President's Shadow take place on Devil's Island. And you'll see, exactly where they kept Lincoln's killers. You'll see exactly what happened to them. You'll see the secret room that's there that you can't go visit even when you think you went and visited that the Park Service gave to me. Um, and those things are real. And what I love the most though of that story is that when one of those killers, Dr. Samuel Mudd, goes to the island, and all of them, like, like the four of them, they're the most hated men in America. Right? They're responsible for killing Abraham Lincoln. And when they get there, Eventually, there's an outbreak of yellow fever, and the doctors are dead at this point. There's a couple of nurses, but they need help. And his name isn't Mr. Samuel Mudd, it's Dr. Samuel Mudd. And so they enlist him to help save people. And Samuel Mudd, on this island, goes from being the most hated man in America to being a hero as he starts saving people. And I love that story because this is an island of transformation. And I'm like, I need to use this island. And the reason I wanted to use it, and I was so obsessed with it, I realized thematically as I was going, is um, it's just my own personal life and where I was. And when I started this book, I'm never smart enough to know exactly where I want the book to go. I kind of figure it out at the end, in term, not in terms of plot, that I know the ending to, but in terms of thematically. You just find, you don't know what you're struggling with until you're 200, 300, 400, and then 500 pages in, I read back and I go, oh, this is what I'm worried about. Not this, it's this. And when I started the book, I was convinced that I wanted this book to be um, about helping me with the deaths of my parents. Because this was the first book I wrote start to finish when my parents were gone. And the last book I wrote, my dad had already passed away, but I'd already plotted out the book and knew what I was doing. This one was holy, they weren't there. And I said, I want this book to help me get over the death of my parents. And it's been a while, it's enough, like get over it, move on. And what I finally realized as I, as I was writing the book is I never wanna get over the death of my parents. My parents deserve to be remembered. And we all know for anyone who's lost someone special in this room, that when you love someone with your whole heart and they pass, it creates a hole in you. It's a hole and you have to fill that hole. And the only way to fill that hole is you must transform. You must transform. And you will not be necessarily a better person, but I promise you when you lose someone that close to you, you will be a different person. You transform. And here I was with this island of transformation. And, and usually when I, uh, always when I write the books, it's me in a room. It's not like I have anyone there with me. I call my wife, I call Noah, I call you know, anyone that I'm talking to and I say, what do you think of this scene? What do you think of that? And I bat things around, they say, that's terrible. And I come, what about this instead? And they say, that's a little more believable, but I don't like this. And that's how I tend to plot things out. But for a full day, I sat there with the last page of the book, with the last sentence. I had the whole last chapter done. And I just wanted that last sentence to be perfect. And I couldn't do it. For a whole day, I sat there with nothing, working on one sentence, because I wanted the final sentence. I was like, this is it. And I know that this is, this is the moment. This is where it all comes together. And I actually called Corey and I said, I need you to come up to the office with me and just, just sit here with me. And we're batting ideas back and forth. And I'm throwing things out. And she's saying no. And she's throwing things out. I'm like, no. And go back and forth. And finally, it blurts out the final sentence that you'll see in this book. And the moment the words came out, I welled up with tears. And I was just like, oh my gosh, this is not Beecher's lesson in this moment. This is my lesson. This isn't his journey. This is my journey. This is what I need at this moment in time. And I'm not some new agey, you know, artiste who feels like, oh, when I touch the keyboard, you can truly see rainbows shoot down. But <laughs> it was one of those moments where I felt like art was magic. And usually every book that I've ever written if you look at the last sentence of the book, 
The last word I pick very carefully. The last word always means something. I never end a sentence where it's like, and then he went outside, and outside, I don't know what that really means. It's always a word that actually stands for something strong and powerful. And I'll redo the whole sentence just to find the perfect word to end on and leave you with. And this was the first time where I said, that's the sentence, it's not changing. This is my journey, and this is where we are. Um, and I will tell you that last night, as I said that, a woman opened up the last page. I'm like, do not open up the last page of that book. <laughs> Do not read the last page of that book right now. And, and, and I was like, you're going to ruin it. I'm like, if you do that, you're last in line. That's it. Um, so, um, so I'm glad, and, and it drives me crazy. I'm like, you can't, you don't ruin the book right now. So um, I know that there are those, you, you're sneaking it. I see you right there, you're sneaking. Um, so that's basically where the president's shadow comes from. That's thematically where it comes from. Uh, and I'll talk about one other thing just because it's fun and I can talk about it here. Uh, because it involves our former governor. But uh, last weekend, uh, my wife and I got to go to Barbara Bush's 90th birthday party. And they ha it was all for literacy. It's a, it's a bipartisan event. They we raised $17 million for literacy, which is great. And they said, you know, it's Barbara Bush's 90th birthday party. They said, we're going to handpick that she and her staff had handpicked four authors to come and entertain. And I was like, wow, who'd you get? And they were like, dummy, it's you. And I was like, Okay, we'll be there. Okay, great. Um, and the best part of it, so we're, we're there, we're in Kennebunkport, we're in their house, and in two rooms that are really no, even smaller than this room we're in. And there can't be, you know, 60 people at the whole place, 20 of them are bushes. I mean, I, I mean, it's unbelievable. And we're sitting there, and there's, between these two rooms, there's Barbara Bush and, uh, and President George H.W. Bush, and then there's Laura Bush, and then there's W, and then there's Jeb Bush, and there's myself and Corey, and the Bush twins are running around in this other third room. And, and my wife looked at me, she's like, at what point in your life did your life become Forrest Gump? Right? I mean, like, it was a ridiculous, and, and, and it was the same for her, too, because she was reading in the newspaper, it said that Jeb Bush had just left. She was reading on the New York Times, right on the homepage, on the front page, it said Jeb Bush had just left to go to Europe. And she's like, no, he didn't. He's right here with me. And she said, Governor, it says you're here in Europe. And he's like, I know, I'm going after the party. And it was one of those surreal moments where you're watching the news and the news is standing right there. Um, and the, the high point of the entire event for me is, again, we're in such close quarters that at one point, Corey has her back to this other guy and he turns around and smashes into my wife. And she just goes flying and then she whips around because you just feel like you got hit. And she's face to face with W. And I'm like, this is gonna be the greatest fight of all time. This is gonna be it. It's gonna be a good one. Um, but happy to say um, fisticuffs did not, uh, were not, no fists, fists were thrown that day. Everyone came home happy. Um, and obviously uh, very excited that we get to do that and of course steal everything we saw and use it in another book. Um, so the next book, don't be surprised. So with that said, you know that what I love doing more than anything is answering questions. You can ask anything you want uh, about fiction. Okay, yes, my son's going to ask a question and God knows what's going to be. Yes, what's your question, sir, young man? Uh, what would you, what book do you, what? What sign did you like no more, Washington D.C. or or New York? What what people did you like more? No, the, 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 what signing? What signing did you like more, Washington D.C. or New York? Hmm. Where do we have more relatives? New York. New York. I loved Washington D.C. Um, no, New York's the best. I mean, New York's the best because, I mean. I, I'm not joking, uh, Mitchell was telling you, I can finish the story, is in Washington, uh, in New York, I went to school in Brooklyn, and at the event was, were my junior high school friends. And what I wrote in his book was, thank you for uh, seeing Return of the Jedi with me when we were 13. So George likes that one, of course. We understand that there are people here that I've seen Return of the Jedi with. And, um, and the thing that was great about the event is we actually had enough people from my, my sixth grade class that we actually sat up here and in school pose, photograph pose, we recreated it and, we, and someone photoshopped in a little sign that said PS206, fifth grade, and we actually redid our fifth grade picture, um, which was fantastic. So anyone here from, uh, from junior high school or high school, I know represents. Uh, so yeah, that's the one I like better. Yes, it's our hand here. I've seen a lot of studies that the uh, American uh, high school student leaves a lot to be desired with American history. I've seen. I saw one poll where half of them don't know that what half century the Civil War took place in. And I heard another anecdotal story 
that a kid thought World War II was World War XI, the two lines were <laughs> uh, So um, I've seen other polls, the European kids seem to know more about American history than we do. What kind of things need to have happen to get the American high school and college student up to speed? Yeah, the question is, why are we so stupid? Um, <laughs> And, uh, you know, here's, but the, here's the thing. So, yes, there are statistics that say that we are so bad at math and English and history and all these things. You know what the American student today is number one in, though? Number one. Facebook. Self-esteem. Self-esteem. We, we think we're the best at everything, um, which is fantastic. I love that. Uh, Facebook, we're definitely we're great at it. We're super great, number one. Um, but I will say, uh, to me, this is the interesting part. So I actually had that same fear, and that fear is what drove the kids' books that I work on. Um, in terms of what, I don't have global answers. I don't have, I'm not a politician. I have my answer for that. And my answer for that is I was tired of my kids looking at a reality TV show star and a loudmouth athlete and thinking that's a hero. And I tell my kids all the time, that's being famous. And being famous is very different than being a hero. So we did I'm Amelia Earhart and we did I am Abraham Lincoln and we started these books to help kids get better American heroes. And we then did Rosa Parks and we did I am Albert Einstein and we did I Am Jackie Robinson. And what I will tell you, because it's fun to talk about, um, is the next book comes out in three weeks. On July 14th, we do I Am Lucille Ball. And I write, I love Lucille Ball. And um, you know, some people said to me, why are you doing Lucy? And by some people said to me, I mean my wife, uh, said, why are you doing Lucy? Because you know, it's like you have Rosa Parks, and then, you know, and then you, Amelia Earhart, I get, but then Lucy. And, and the answer is, is I said, I want my daughter to have an entertainment hero who isn't just famous because she's pretty and thin. I want her to have a hero who, it's not just okay to be different, but it's spectacular to be different. That's what Lucy was. To me, the best part, no, I appreciate it. The very best part of who we all are is that we're different. Look at what's happened in Charleston. The one thing that we all have in common and we refuse to acknowledge is we're all different. That's what we all have in common. It's the only thing. We're all different. And we need to be, have to actually celebrate that. And Lucy stands for exactly that. She was different than everyone else out there from when she was a little kid to when she was older. She was, became the first woman when it was unheard of to do such a thing. It was, it was just crazy. You should never be this different. First woman to run her own studio. She produced TV shows like Star Trek and Mission Impossible. Do you know how much nerd goodness that gives me alone? <laughs> I owe this woman, um, and I love that we get to do this book. And the fun of the book is when you get to, you, the book, of course, looks like the other kids' books, but when you get to the chocolate conveyor belt scene, the book goes black and white, and the whole book goes black and white again. And I, we do that book, and then uh, three months after that, two months after that, in September, we do I Am Helen Keller. And I, my favorite book I think that we've done so far is Abraham Lincoln. It's just a, it just came out in a way that was really special. and. For me, the other one is, uh, is Helen Keller. And when you read these books, when you read the kids' books, every drawing in there, I tell Chris Eliopoulos, our amazing, wonderful artist who I love and who I drive crazy every day, because I tell him exactly what the angle should be. You know, the, the camera should be behind the person so you see the back of his head and then the crowd in front of him so you really get a sense of who he's talking to. That we should have a worm's eye view from the ground looking up at Amelia Earhart as she points to the sky from behind so you can sense just how big and vast the whole earth and universe feels as she looks up at that plane flying above. And Chris every time exceeds expectations, of course, but when he handed in the art for Helen Keller, it just was beyond anything. Sometimes, you know, for those who read comics, when I did Identity Crisis, there were pages that I got in and I was like, this is beyond what I wrote. The page where Sue Dibney dies, I was like, this is beyond anything I ever could put on paper. And it was just that perfect merger of artist and writer where you get something that is greater than the two of us. And there were things obviously I designed. When you get to the pages where Helen Keller goes blind, uh, the pages are both black. And they just say, this is how I see the world. Cover your ears. This is how I hear the world. And when you get to where she learns how to read, um, we actually got the publisher to spring for the extra money. Is you, there's actually real braille in the book. And then it says, touch these dots. This is my name, my name's Helen. Now find your name. And the whole Braille alphabet is there. And I knew we were onto something because my 13 year old, um, who once said to me, Dad, I hate to read. And I was like, you know what I do for a living, right? <laughs> like, you know what feeds us. But I caught him a couple weeks ago. He had grabbed an early proof copy of I Am Helen Keller. 
and he was reading it. And he said, Dad, this is a good one. And I love him for reading it. I love that he's engaged with it. It's obviously, you know, he knows it's like, but he just, he, he knew that there's something special in this story. And it's a real redefinition of how you see Helen Keller. Um, it's not, Helen Keller's always someone who's seen as sad and she's like mopey and, you know, she's blind and we should pity her. And all those things, those adjectives are ridiculous. And, you know, you see her in a picture by the well and she's like, wah, wah, like that. And we should pity the blind and deaf girl. And I get why that is the, is the representation. But when I actually read her writings and read her autobiography, this girl is alive. And Chris always draws the covers months before I write the book. He's never read the book when he draws the cover because I, we have to do the cover so far early to make the catalog. So he draws four covers. We pick one and we go. But he drew four of Helen Keller, and I was like, no, none of those. He drew another four. I was like, no, none of those. And he said, I, don't, I haven't read the book yet. What is it? And I said, I said, what she loved more than anything was being outside. Because when she was outside, she would literally be running because she could feel the sun on her face. She could smell the flowers. Outside, she was living bigger than anyone. And so he said, oh, I got it, exuberant. And we send the book to Helen Keller's estate. And now we're nervous because to me, this is a redefinition of how Helen Keller's seen. She's like, on the cover, she's like Julie Andrews running on the mountaintop. And that's how we did it. I was like, she's exuberant. She needs to be alive and happy, not sad and morose. And we sent it to Helen Keller's estate. And we're nervous because now you don't know if they're going to like our representation or not. And they came back and said, this is so different. And this is how we see her. And we're so happy you see her like that too. So I think you're in for a real redefinition of her. We do after that, we do I am Martin Luther King Jr. in January. And our goal has always been, it's never about just giving you Lucille Ball or Amelia Earhart or Abraham Lincoln, but it's to help you build a library of real heroes for your kids and your grandkids and your nieces and your nephews. And um, I love that people are buying them for their schools and for homeless shelters and you know buying whole packs of them so that they can give this library to kids out there. So that's my answer. That's what I think we need to go. I think we just, and I know that I'm not alone because I've now, this is the, um, the end of the first week of the tour and every single stop, Everyone, New York, DC, Virginia, Vero Beach, Dallas, five stops so far, every one of them, the kids' books sold out. And it's not because of me, it's because people like you realize we need that today in America. And that to me is what's right right now. So that's another. So I hand over here. Yes? Yeah, when are we going to the movies together? Um, listen, I would love to do that, of course. Uh, there's no question. It's really hard to make a movie. You think of a big author right now, my friend David Baldacci. Right, one of the top five authors, you know, writes thrillers and has had one movie, even though he's got 20, 25 books, whatever it is. It's just really hard. Have you seen a Mary Higgins Clark movie lately? Have you seen a Nelson DeMille movie lately? They're really hard to make. Um, the best part of that is when, when someone asked that question uh, in New York and my agent, my film agent was in the front row. And so I'm like, my film agent is right here. The pressure's on. And I look down and she's texting. And I'm like, that's why we're not making a film right here. She's not even listening to what I'm saying. Um, so obviously I'd love to do that. That's icing on an already great cake. Uh, I love the fact that we've gotten these TV shows is a miracle to me and, and really uh, anything else is, as I said, icing on that great cake. Yes? So it's Father's Day weekend. It's Father's Day weekend, says the woman with a newborn yes. baby. I like, thank you for bringing the baby. Oh, uh, what? This is a loaded question here. What is the? Because anyone, the people laughing are the people who know my father. Um, is what I learned from my dad on how to be a good dad, and, and I actually can answer that very easily. And that is, um, and I'll, I'll tell you two things about it. So, when my uh, when my dad died for his eulogy, I talked about how he was struck by lightning. He actually was struck by lightning, and that his own father, my grandfather, was also struck by lightning. Wow, I was right. Don't stand next to me in the rain, right? <laughs> and I knew my grandfather was struck by lightning because it was in his army discharge papers. That's why he got discharged because of the burns. And but my dad always told us he was struck by lightning. The truth was it was a great story, but knowing my father, I was like, is it a true story? I don't know. I have no idea. My dad loved to tell a good story, but he would always insist the exact same way. Uh, and unlike other stories, it did get better over time. It just it really stayed the same. And when he passed, I said in his eulogy, I don't know if it's true, but I'm going to assume it is because I love that story and it was an amazing metaphor. And a couple weeks after he passed, uh, some guy writes me through our website and says, Dear Brad, I knew your dad and I'm so sorry to hear he passed. And I saw, because I put the eulogy on the website, it's still on there now, that 
you didn't know if he was struck by lightning. And I just want to tell you he was, and I know because I was there with him that day. And in that moment, that stranger became the most important man in the universe to me because he had new information about my dead father. And, and it wasn't just that he had new information, but in that moment, my father's alive again because I got something new. There's something I don't have. And when I look back at my dad and everything I learned from him, my dad made a lot of mistakes and he did a lot of amazing things. He moved us from Brooklyn, New York to Miami, Florida, one of the greatest moves he ever made with no job and no place to live. Um, ballsy as could be and bold and amazing. Um, and you know, he did amazing things like when I said, I wanna to go to the University of Michigan and he had no business letting me go. He should have said, go in state, I can't afford it. He didn't start saving for college until the year before I went. Um, that was his financial sense of planning. But when I looked him in the eye and said, I got into Michigan, he looked me, at me back and instead of saying, you know what, I can't afford it, he said, you're going, I'm gonna make it happen. And so no one gave out more, but the lesson I take, and it's, a le it's really the lesson I take from my mother and my father, which is you can screw everything else up. You can make bad decisions. You can do financial things really in, in a poor way. Um, you can get into fist fights and yell at people. You can do whatever you want, but all you gotta do is love your kid. You just love your kid and let your kid feel loved with all your might and anything's possible with that child. Because I know that when I was growing up, my dad sat me down one day and he said, whatever you do in school, I used to get D's. Your grades are gonna be better than that. Don't worry about it. Um, and he didn't care what I did. He didn't care if I messed up. Whenever, when I got into trouble, in fact, when my parents died, a woman wrote to me who I knew growing up and said to me, the one thing I always knew about your parents, even when they got mad at you, is they just loved you. They always forgave you. They always loved you. And that, to me, is the secret sauce in parenting. The secret sauce is love. Yes, over here. Uh, odd question. Can you see yourself forgiving the South Carolina slaughterer? The first okay, totally appropriate for a fictional novel. I like it. <laughs> second part? The second part is, can you picture in your mind's eye at one point when this thing is somehow resolved, because we don't know a time frame, that you would think about putting it in the form of a novel? novel. Okay, so the question is, is you know, uh, first, can I see myself forgiving um, that kid who shot and killed those poor victims in Charleston? And the second part is, could you see yourself writing about it? And so let's deal with the second part first. That's the easy question. Um, no, not a chance. I never, ever compete with reality. Um, my job as a fiction writer, uh, I can't beat reality. Reality is crazy enough. I have to go one step further. I have to, and when I go to the Secret Service, I'll always say to them, don't tell me what the problem is now. Tell me what the problem is in 10 years because I'm going to work two years on it. I can't compete with reality. The newspaper's for that. That's what you read the newspaper for. Um, but to your other part, can you forgive a victim for killing someone. Listen, um, that's, you know, that's a very personal question and I can't possibly say that I'd ever feel good if God forbid that happened to my family. I know what I would want to happen, God forbid that happened to my family. But I do know one thing, that when bad things happen in your life, uh, that hate, it weighs on your shoulders for your life. And the only way to move forward with your life is to remove that hate. And I don't know if it's forgiveness, I don't know if it's um, you know, some other magical way, understanding, there's a lots of, lot of other words that you can put to it, but I do know if you carry around hatred, um, you will be dead soon. And you have to find some way to make peace. And if you don't make peace, uh, you have bigger problems than you can ever imagine. So that's how I see it. Let me give another person a chance right there behind you. Oh, my question is back to Kira as well. The fictional kind, the one who's left buildings, if you know who I mean. The question is immediately from the deaths of Charleston, in uh, South Carolina to Batman. Here we go. You, I love your work with DC, by the way. So between, you did Justice League, Green Arrow, and Buffy. Out of all those three, which was your favorite to do? Yeah, the question is, is um, Justice League, you said Green Arrow is the second one, and Buffy? Yeah. Okay, so between uh, the Justice League, which I've written, and listen, for those who don't know, I write comic books. I love writing my thrillers. I love writing the kids' books. I love doing our TV show. There's nothing like when I get to sit in my house and write B-A-T-M-A-N and I put words in Batman's mouth. That's a really cool day at work. On that day, I'm so excited. I'm wearing my underwear on the outside of my pants, right? <laughs> like it's nobody's business. Um, and the question is, I've written the Justice League. I've written Green Arrow, um, who you see on the TV show Arrow. Uh, and I've written Buffy the Vampire Slayer with Joss Whedon. And which one do I like best? And that's like saying, which of your kids do you like best? There's, you, you don't pick. Um, the Justice League, I will say, that's the book I grew up on. That's the book that really, between that and the Teen Titans, made me a writer. 
And I, wanted, I waited my whole life to work on that book where I could sit down and they said, you can pick your Justice League and put whoever you want on it. And right now to this day, you can go on my website and click on it. There's a tour that you can take of my office and you'll see that what sits on my desk is a Lego version of my Justice League. And it's just, you know, so nerdy, it's fantastic. Um, but to me, there's nothing nerdy about loving something that you love. Um, but Justice League was just it for me. Let me just make sure I get from different parts of the room. And I saw one in the back, but I lost you. Yes. Uh, one, of my favorite, uh, one of my favorite episodes of your show, Decoded, was the one on Fort Knox. Yep. And I remember there were about three theories that were uh, surrounding the gold in Fort Knox. One was the gold is there and it's, everything's normal. One is, it, is that it's not there and there's something wrong. And then another one is that the gold belongs to somebody else, but it's still within Fort Knox. Which one of those theories do you believe uh, is the correct one? Yeah, so the question is about um, on Dakota. Thank you for the question. Um, on Dakota, we did, is there really gold in Fort Knox anymore? And uh, it's an amazing story, right? Because no one's been there to check it in, I think, 39 years. No one's seen the gold. They did have an audit. They showed it, and then no one's been in there. And we actually got the senator from Kentucky came on the show who was there the last time they opened it, and he's like, I don't know if there's anything in there. And that's what, this isn't some kooky crazy person, right? This is the, well, Senator from Kentucky. <laughs> I just made that joke up right now. That was a good one. Uh, that joke doesn't work in Kentucky either. It doesn't. Um, but my theory, uh, of course, I don't know. I want to know. I, the one thing I'll tell you is we were this close to getting inside. The people at Fort Knox actually said yes to us. The colonel who I became friends with there, because I went there to speak once, they asked me to come speak, said, I want to get you in there. And uh, we had to go. We were going into Fort Knox with the cameras. And at the last minute, who shut it down wasn't the military. It was the Treasury Department. It was the Treasury Department that actually stopped us and said, no, they're not, you're not going in. The military side that actually guards it was fine. They, they, they realized it's a good thing. Um, my theory is, is I do think the gold is in there. I don't think there's actually as much as there used to be. Um, and it's just based on theories that people in law enforcement have told me that sometimes when you exchange hostages for other things, um, you don't want dollar bills. Um, and gold is a currency that's used around the world, and sometimes you need gold. So I can't prove it, but that's my theory, and that's where we go. Yes? Did the Treasury Department say why? No, the Treasury Department's not going to tell me why. They just, you know, no is the answer. But God knows. Okay, we'll do one more question. It's hot in here, I know. Uh, yes, sir? Brad, as a fellow author, I congratulate you. Your words are magic. I agree. <laughs> Can you use some of that magic and get the air conditioning going? Yeah, no. <laughs> Only in Florida did the Jews say, it's hot in here already. OK, yes, last question. Okay. I want to take this opportunity to commend you, your wife, all your staff, because you're one of the most engaged um, writers that I, I have ever found. I constantly get emails. You keep me up to date. I've got it. a personal invitation. Well, the staff, when you say you have to thank your staff, um, thank my wife and my mother-in-law, and um, they, I mean, truly, it is a family affair. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. I appreciate it. Well, let me say this. Um, that's actually the perfect way to end, um, because this is a family affair. And this event and this signing, of course, is a family affair, because only family would put up with this heat, right? Um, <laughs> But again, let me say thank you. That's all I need to say. It's the most important thing I need to say and all I really came here to say. I'm obviously happy to sign books. I'll sign anything. And, um, and thank you to Mitchell again for always being the host for the most. OK. On this side. Brad Meltzer, what a great, great event. The only good thing about it being hot inside is that it'll make it seem really cool outside. And the good news is Brad will sign everybody's book. The book signing will happen on the other side. Books are for sale on both registered. However, if you can't wait, Brad's already pre-signed some books, which you can purchase. And tonight, we have an amazing musical act in the courtyard. His name is Brooklyn Red. And you're welcome to stay and hang out in the courtyard as well. Thank you all for coming. Yeah, if, if, if you can, Fold a chair or two and put it against the wall as well. Thanks.
Thank you.